All right, guys, here comes the third and final conic section uh, that we're going to be looking at, which is the hyperbola. Uh, I'll show you quickly the formula here on page 587. Um, so it looks like this or this. Uh, you'll notice, of course, on this that it is extremely similar to um, the ellipse. Sorry, I'm drawing blank. So extremely similar to the ellipse. Uh, here's the really the only difference is there is a minus here instead of a plus. Uh, so what we're going to see on this one is there is a positive term and there is a negative term. So obviously we want the positive term to be first. Um, and just like with the ellipse, that first term is kind of the heart of your information. So if my positive term is the x squared term, then I know my hyperbola will open up to the right and to the left. If my positive term is the y squared, then it would open up or down like the second one that you see right here. So for these guys, we're still looking at um, a squared, the positive one, um, as the one where you would find the main information, right? Your vertices, uh, that's going to help us find our foci, things like that. So because there is a minus instead of a plus, uh, that is what's causing these two blue curves to go away from each other instead of towards each other. So when it was an ellipse, so if you could picture uh, flipping this guy 180 and flipping this guy 180 so that they're actually facing each other, then it would look like an ellipse, right? It would look like an oval, um, but that's when this is a plus sign. When it's a minus sign, it causes them to go away from each other instead of towards each other. So that's kind of the major difference here. Um, but otherwise, there's a lot of similarities between this and the ellipse. So we're still going to use uh, the value of a to figure out the distance to our vertices. We're still going to use a value for c to figure out uh, the distance to the foci. Um, now, one of the differences on this relationship uh, is you'll notice that now c squared equals a squared plus b squared. Whereas in the ellipse, it was a squared minus b squared. So we do have to separate out those two things. Um, really, the way that it's always stuck in my mind is I remember that this formula is the opposite of what I see here. So when this is a minus, this is a plus. And in the ellipse, where this is a plus, this is a minus. Uh, so that's the way it's just always just stuck out in my head is it's always the opposite of my formula. Um, but whatever it takes to remember this stuff, right? So um, so as we look at this, uh, there is, unlike the ellipse, where they had the major axis and the minor axis, uh, they don't, that doesn't really exist for the hyperbola. Uh, what we have is a transverse axis. The transverse axis is the one that runs through the heart of all of your important points, right? It, it runs the direction that your hyperbola opens. So if your hyperbola opens left and right, then your transverse axis is running horizontal. If you have a hyperbola that's opening up and down, then your transverse axis would run up and down. Right. So that's the main one is called the transverse axis. Uh, the one that we don't really use much um, is called the conjugate axis. So the conjugate axis would look like this. It's like right here would be the conjugate axis. So one of the ways that we can draw our hyperbola is by using these asymptotes as like our guiding lines on where to draw the curves. And that's something we'll go over here in a minute. And I'll show you kind of how we can draw those. There, there's really two ways. One is with a formula, which is just like B over A is your slope, right? So if, if, if I have, um, my transverse axis is a horizontal, then these lines, those dotted lines that you see, are just are just positive b over a and negative b over a, where b over a is just your slope. So we can we can look at it that way. There is kind of another way that's kind of neat where you're drawing like a rectangle, um, and I, I'd like to show you that one too. So we'll take a look at that here in a minute. So anyway, that's kind of the heart of our stuff. Let's let's get into some examples here. So one of the main things, of course, is um, I want this to equal 1. So again, they're going to divide everything by 225 in order to make this equal 1. Let me, I'm going to try to zoom in on this a little bit because I can see it's a little fuzzy, and I'm trying to clear it up as best as I can. 
me see if that helps. So then, again, we're going to divide all of this by 225. Uh, and if you do that, it's going to look like this. So again, since my leading term, my positive term, is the x term, um, I know this thing's going to open left and right. And my conjugate axis is going to go up and down based on this. Guys, you will notice on this that this does not have to be the bigger number. This could have been the 9 and this could have been the 25. So we're not really looking at the hyperbola as which one of these is bigger. That is A or B. Uh, rather, we look at as which one is positive. So whichever one is positive, right, that's our A term. Whichever one is the negative is the B term. So just keep that in mind. Um, as far as identifying the foci, again, we're using basic Pythagorean theorem right here to identify that guy. Uh, remember that just like with the ellipse, along that main axis, what we call it, what we were calling the transverse axis on this, uh, that's where your foci would go as well. Okay, and so if your if your hyperbola is going to open up left and right, then your high, then your foci are going to go left and right as well. Let's let's go through one so we can identify kind of some of the main information here with this guy. So first things first, we would divide everything by 100 so that we could be looking at this equation right here. So this is standard form. That's the way that we want it to look before we start doing stuff. Uh, so now that we have it in standard form, we can pull out our main pieces of info. Again, we're going to see this is as centered at 0, 0 because it's just x squared and y squared. There's nothing else up there. So our center is at 0, 0. Uh, looking at this, we're going to have to go left and right five units in order to get to our vertices. So I'm going to go left and right five units. And that's going to give me my two vertices. Uh, as far as the foci, remember we now are doing c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So c is going to be, oops, c is going to equal plus or minus rad 29. All right, and so remember, these guys are going to go the same direction that our vertices are going. So if our vertices are going left and right, then so are the foci. So I always want to attach these onto the x-coordinate of the center in this case. Since we are centered at 0, 0, we're just going to throw those guys in for the x-coordinate. And there's our foci. So pretty simple, uh, extremely similar to what we already have done with the ellipse. So we just got to keep those signs in order, pluses and minuses, and make sure uh, we're getting the right signs in there. So for this one, they're wanting us to uh, now come up with the equation of our hyperbola. Uh, so at this one, um, you know, right off the bat, as I look at these two foci, I can see that this one is also centered at 0, 0. Because if I went left 5 and right 5, right, if I found the midpoint of those foci, I can see that I'm centered at 0, 0. So nice and simple on that part. Um, our C value is obviously 5. Um, and they're telling me that the shorter axis, the conjugate axis, I guess it's not necessarily shorter, but the one that does not run through the two vertices um, has a length, a total length of 4. Which means from the center you would go like up to and down to, or left to and right to. So that's going to be our B value. Always good just to identify the uh, formula that you're working with. So on this one, you'll notice on the foci that these guys are in the Y slot. So that means I'm going to be looking at Y squared over A squared minus X squared over B squared equals 1. So there's like my general formula that I'm going to be plugging into. The only things I got to come up with are A and B. Uh, now looking at this information, the only one we really know for sure is B, right? Because when they told me that my conjugate axis has a total length of 4, right, that means my B value is 2 because I would have been going like left 2 and right 2 in order to get the two main points on that conjugate axis. 
So for this guy, if I plug in a 2 for my B value, we're going to get 2 squared, which is 4. That's where they came up with this one. So how did they come up with that A value? Well, on this one, we know based on these numbers that my C value is 5. We just figured out that our B value is 2. And now we can plug into our formula, basically Pythagorean theorem, right, that says C squared equals uh, A squared plus B squared in order to get the 21 that they came up with for this guy. So we're just going to plug into that formula nice and easy, and that tells us that A squared is 21. Uh, so as far as uh, sketching this, and we're going to get to the asymptotes here in just a second, uh, but as far as making a sketch, again, we know we're centered at 0, 0. Uh, based on this, we had to go the square root of 21, uh, which would be, what, about 4.5? So I would have to go about 4.5 units up and down to get my two vertices. So I'm going to go about 4.5 units up and about four and a half units down. Those are going to be my two vertices. So there's one and there's one. Um, as far as making the rest of this curve, uh, what I would do is you make use of the asymptotes uh, in order to get what they're calling this central rectangle. Uh, so here, here's kind of how this would work. Um, and, and this is where the B value comes into play. So in order to get those B values, we're going left and right two units. And again, these are not points on the curves. These are there as kind of a guide. Uh, and you're going to see that here in just a second. So if you look at our vertices and kind of like the co-vertices that we came up with for the ellipse, what we're going to do is basically make a rectangle through those points. So it looks like this. So the reason we do that is the asymptotes are the diagonals of that rectangle. So I'm going to have one asymptote that, that is this diagonal right here. If I can draw a straight line, I'll do my best. So one of my asymptotes is that guy, and my other asymptote is going to be the other diagonal which is going to go something like that so these are my two asymptotes and the reason we draw those is I can now draw my curve within those asymptote lines so I'll use a different color here so here's my vertex and I'm now going to draw my hyperbola through the vertex so that it just fits inside those asymptotes. So I'm going to do the same thing with this one. And remember on this one, we knew it was going to be the up and down locations because the y squared is our positive term on this one. Our leading term, our positive one, tells us the direction of our hyperbola. <coughs> so the pink, the pink graph that you're seeing is the only actual graph of this hyperbola. All the blue stuff uh, was there to help guide us on where to draw those pink curves. But it's just the pink curves that are the actual graph. Um, so anyway, that's kind of our process for doing that. Let me flip over here. All right, so for this one, again, uh, this is kind of one of those other scenarios where uh, they're giving us some information and we're trying to come up with the equation of the hyperbola that fits that description. Um, so as I mentioned before, it, it really does help to sketch uh, some information here. Um, if you want to see the full formulas for the ones that are shifted away from 0, 0, you can look on 588, but really not much different. Uh, than what we did with the ellipse. It's just a minus instead of a plus. I mean, that's it. That's that's like the only difference here in this formula. So uh, let me let me kind of show you. So this one says the transverse axis, 
Remember, that's like the one that is like the main axis. That's the one that runs through your vertices and your foci. So that's important. So the endpoints are negative 2, negative 1. So I plotted that point right there. And 8, negative 1, I plotted that point right there. Um, and the conjugate axis, the one that goes perpendicular to that one, has a total length of 8. Okay, and so let's use that information to see what we can come up with here. Um, in, in just a rough sketch of this, if my vertices are to the left and to the right, because that's where my um, transverse axis is traveling, then that means my hyperbola would open to the left and to the right. So the hyperbola they're talking about here would look something like this. I know this is just a total rough sketch, but uh, the reason I... I always want to point that out is because then it helps guide me into what formula I should be looking at. So if these guys are going left and right, that means my X term has to go first. And we're no longer at zero, zero. So that's why I got to include the H and the K in here, right? We can see right here, my center is obviously not at zero, zero. That would be over here. So this one is the y minus k squared over b squared. And like I said, it's like the same formula as the ellipse, but it's a minus instead of a plus. Otherwise, there's not much different here. So um, I can get h and k the same way we did this before. It's simply the midpoint of my two vertices. So if I were to add these up and divide by 2, that would give me the midpoint, which is the center of this hyperbola. So uh, if we added up the x's, I would get 6 divided by 2, which is 3. And if we do that with the y values, if I add those up, I get negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1. y plus 1 squared. So we just came up with h and k, which would be our center. And that's looking pretty good at 3, negative 1 is looking good. Uh, so the only thing i got to figure out here is my a squared and b squared. So a is going to be fairly simple to figure out. Remember, that's just the distance from the center to a vertex. So from 3, negative 1 to 8, negative 1, right, that would be a difference of 5 units. So if a is 5, then a squared is 25. Uh, as far as b squared, uh, this is why they're telling us that the conjugate axis has a total length of 8. So if the total length is 8, then remember from the center to either endpoint would just be half of that, which would be 4. So here's kind of the full picture. Um, so if b is 4, then b squared would be 16. And that's it. That would be the equation for their description. So final example for this one, we're just going to go through and kind of find all the major parts here. So we're all clear on all that stuff. So here's uh, the general layout of this formula. Again, just like we saw up above, very similar to the ellipse, just a little different because of the minus sign. So first things first, I was always I would always figure out the center. So I, I kind of made this one more of a fill in the blank, so it'd go by a little bit quicker because we've, we've really identified a lot of these things already. So um, just by looking at the x minus three and the y plus four, we can identify the center. Um, always the opposite sign because the negatives were already built into that formula. So we're going to use a positive three, negative four for h and k. Let's see if I can write small enough to fit into their pieces down here. So um, the semi-transverse axis, um, all that means is, remember the transverse axis is the full axis that runs through the vertices. The semi-transverse would just be half of it, right? So if we were to look at this, we can see that the a squared is 4. So a would be the square root of 4, which is obviously 2. So our a value is 2. Uh, so as far as identifying the vertices, we can tell that they're going to be left and right from the center. So if this is my center, um, I know I need to travel left and right two units from the center. So that means they're going to attach to the x coordinate. So it's going to be 3 plus 2 negative 4, because that y value is not going to change. And it would be 3 minus 2, 
negative 4. All right, so we're just adding and subtracting the 2 from the x-coordinate. So if we clean that up, 3 plus 2 is going to give us 5, negative 4. And this guy is going to give us 1, negative 4. So and we've talked about doing this already in previous problems. This is just kind of the way you're doing it without looking at the graph. Um, as far as getting our foci, so we know that our um, c value is just going to fit that Pythagorean theorem model. So if we're doing a little a squared plus b squared. So again, remember on this, now that this is a minus, that means we're going to use a squared plus b squared. So it's always the opposite of your formula. Um, so on this one, our a squared is a 4, b squared is 25. So if we fill those guys in, we're overall looking at the square root of 29. Um, and again, just like the vertices attached to the x-coordinate, of our center, they attach to H. Um, the foci would also do the same thing. They're going to do whatever the vertices do. So if the vertices attach to K, then so would your foci. Uh, in this case, they're both attaching to H. So that's why the layout looks like this. So we have our H value, which was a 3, plus or minus rad 29, comma, negative 4. I don't even know if I can fit that in there, but we'll try. So there's, there's kind of the appropriate way to write our uh, coordinates of our foci. We could write those as decimals, so it would look like this. Um, and I would definitely do that if I needed to show where they were on a graph. Um, the one last thing I wanted to remind you guys of was eccentricity. We talked about that with the ellipse. Uh, so eccentricity is the same formula as the ellipse, so that's nice. Uh, it is still C over A. So in this case... Uh, we found our C value to be rad 29. And our A value was the square root of 4, which was 2. And that's it. So there's our eccentricity. Um, and that's really all the major pieces that we got to be able to come up with on these guys.